This is our first subscriber special. It will take more than 5 minutes, because the story of this ship is complex and hilarious enough that it needs a lot longer to explain. The ship in question is the Rio de Janeiro. No wait. Sultan Osman I Evel. No, wait, it's actually the HMS Agincourt. Well, actually, it's all of these. So you can see why this is a little bit of a complicated ship to tell the history of. To understand why the ship existed in the first place, we must take a look at South America. Not the first place that comes to mind when you think of a naval arms race, but at the start of the 20th century it briefly had more modern battleships than some of the traditional major naval powers. This arose from a kind of three-way Mexican standoff between Chile, Argentina and Brazil that had been going on since the three countries were founded. Each of them wanted to be seen as the most powerful nation on the continent, but none of them were strong enough to take on the other two combined to prove it. During the latter part of the 19th century, South America was actually the most active prolonged naval combat zone, with multiple wars involving wooden and ironclad ships between various nations. An early ironclad, the Huascar, was involved at one point in an inconclusive fight with the Royal Navy frigate HMS Shah. What made this battle important was that it saw the first use of a torpedo, which was fired at the Peruvian ironclad, since the Shah's guns could not hurt the heavily armoured ironclad, but the Huascar was too slow to close with the frigate. The torpedo missed, by the way, and if you're ever in Chile, you can go and see the ironclad. Why is it in Chile? Well, because Chile later went to war with Peru, and the Chilean navy would capture the Huascar. As the 20th century began, the economies of the three countries mentioned earlier were booming through trade in rubber, coffee, meat and minerals, amongst other things. Whilst the price of a single unit of such resources was relatively low compared to complex manufactured goods, the sheer volume of sales was enough to give these countries massive windfalls of cash. So of course they promptly began spending it on weapons to threaten their neighbours. When once one of them started, the others felt they had to keep up or outdo them. Argentina and Chile were the main competitors, as Brazil was in a certain amount of chaos following the overthrow of the Brazilian monarchy at the end of the 19th century. The two navies quickly filled with modern warships, but had just managed to come to an agreement to limit the huge amounts of money being spent on their navies, when, of course, the HMS Dreadnought was launched. The Brazilians had planned to order three small battleships in the traditional design style, but saw a chance to overtake their rivals in a single step and change the order to Dreadnought-type battleships. Chile and Argentina would then promptly abandon their treaty and order their own Dreadnoughts to keep up, and the race was back on. Two Brazilian ships were ordered from British shipyards, the Minas Gerais class. The Argentines would then order two from American yards after getting designs from multiple yards and trying to combine them. And then of course the Chileans ordered two, also from British yards. As a result, although the Brazilian ships were the first to arrive, they would end up being the least powerful. The Minas Gerais and Sao Paulo would each carry six turrets with twin 12-inch guns in a hybrid layout that partially reflected American design practice and partially British battleships of the time. They had two turrets forward and two aft, with both pairs super-firing like the American South Carolina class, but also two wing turrets that were offset in a manner very similar to the Neptune-class battleships of the Royal Navy and the Kaiser-class battleships of the German High Seas Fleet. This gave a practical broadside of 10 guns. The Argentine reply would consist of the Rivadavia-class battleships, which followed the same layout and gun type, but were bigger and more heavily protected, with cross-deck firing possible. Chile took one look at both and decided they could do even better, ordering ships which were heavily influenced by the British Orion class of so-called Super Dreadnoughts. These Almirante Latore class battleships had five twin turrets, and with all turrets on the centre line, could give a full ten-gun broadside with a fairly wide arc, saving the weight of a sixth turret, which could then go into armour and bigger guns. The Orion class carried 13.5-inch guns, an escalation that made them substantially more powerful compared to all existing dreadnoughts, which typically carried 12-inch weapons. The Chilean order went even further with 14-inch guns. These larger calibers would characterise British and American battleships during the early 1910s, before themselves being superseded by the 15- and 16-inch weapons in later designs. Faced with this, the Brazilian government decided they had to order additional ships to compensate for the individual inferiority of their own vessels. 
This is where we finally get to the ship we're actually talking about. The original order had been for three ships, but the third one had not yet been built, and with the advent of the ships of Chile and Argentina, it was felt that to justify the additional cost to the general public, they needed their third ship to be superior to both existing battleships in their own navy and the ones being built for their rivals. At first, this meant having 14-inch guns like the ships being built for Chile, except with 12 of them instead of 10. There was also an option considered for eight 16-inch guns in twin turrets, which would have made the ships the most powerful battleship in the world by a fair margin. But the costs of modifying the design they had for these bigger guns was high, and the economic boom that was funding the arms race was beginning to slow down. Additionally, there was a revolt in the Brazilian Navy over the conditions aboard their ships. When this had become apparent, they tried to get out of building it at all, but the shipyard Armstrong had written the contract in such a way that would have meant they would have had to pay just as much to cancel the order, only they wouldn't have a battleship to show for it. So they came to a compromise. It was cheaper to lengthen the ship and add more 12-inch guns, so they decided to go with that. But their existing ships already had 12 guns, and the Chilean ships would be carrying tw 10 larger 14-inch weapons. The calculations showed that even moving all the turrets to the centre line, as the Americans had done with their Wyoming class, would not give superior firepower, as the two extra guns would not compensate for the individually weaker shells. So, in addition to moving all the guns to the centre line, they decided to add another twin turret for a total of seven turrets, carrying 14 guns in the same 12-inch calibre as before. This made the newly named Rio de Janeiro the most heavily armed battleship ever built in terms of number of guns installed. The turrets were arranged, with two turrets super-firing forward, two turrets in the middle of the ship, and three at the aft end, with the middle turret at the aft end super-firing over the other two. This resulted in a ship that looked more like a turret farm than a battleship in the traditional sense, and there was a certain degree of concern that with so many guns and their associated recoil, a full broadside might either tip the ship over or snap it in half. It sacrificed armour to carry all these turrets with only 9 inches of belt armour, but at 22 knots with its turbine engines it was a fraction faster than most battleships of the time. However, by 1913 it was fairly clear that Brazil was not in any position to keep funding the ship's construction, and it was put up for sale before it was even completed. As it happened, the craze for owning dreadnoughts was all the rage in early 1900s and 1910s Europe, and there was a power that was in the market for such a ship. That was the Ottoman Empire. Being offered one that was nearly complete was an extra bonus, so they decided to buy it from Brazil, renaming it, it Sultan Osman I Evel. This was to supplement an existing battleship they had ordered from British shipyards, which, like the Chilean ships, was derived from an existing British design, in this case the King George V class, which had been the follow-on to the Orion class. The two Ottoman ships were very important to their public, as the government had not had enough money to order them from the existing budget, and so a lot of money had been raised by public subscription, which meant that many people felt a much closer connection to what they saw as their battleships than was normal. The ship was launched and began sea trials in early 1914. Due to its original purpose as a flagship, the accommodations on board were much more luxurious than was normal, at least as far as battleship accommodations can be thought of as luxurious. A Turkish captain and crew arrived to take control of the ship, but then World War I broke out. The British had quite a number of battleships in their shipyards that were being built or nearly completed that belonged to foreign governments. In order to ensure the maximum superiority of ships and firepower against the Germans, the British offered all the governments affected a deal. This was to buy the ships from them immediately for use in the Royal Navy, then to either refit and return them at the end of the war, or else make further compensation with other ships or cash. Chile was a British ally, and the takeover of their two ships went relatively smoothly, the first being named HMS Canada, and being returned to Chile after the war, where it survived well into the 1950s. The other ship was not nearly as complete, and was turned into the aircraft carrier HMS Eagle. When the war ended, the Chilean government wanted the ship turned back into a battleship and sent to Chile, but the cost of reconverting it was too high, and the Eagle stayed with the Royal Navy until it was sunk by a German submarine in World War II. As compensation, the other ships ordered by Chile were sold back to them at reduced prices.
However, the Ottomans did not want to give up their ships, and the Turkish crew threatened to take over the ship by force. But the Germans and Ottomans had signed a secret alliance a few months before, and there was some indication that British intelligence knew about this. Fearing that if the ship was handed over, it would be, it would be used against the Royal Navy, First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill ordered it be seized and defended with all necessary measures. Shortly thereafter, the ship was commissioned into the Royal Navy as HMS Agincourt, using the name which had been reserved for the 6th Queen Elizabeth-class battleship which had been cancelled at the outbreak of the war. Predictably, this action caused public outrage in the Ottoman Empire and was used as part of the justification to join the German side of World War I. Helped by the German donation of the battlecruiser Goben and the cruiser Breslau, which had been chased into Ottoman ports by the Royal and French navies in the Mediterranean Sea. The Germans claimed these ships were free replacements for the seized battleships, although in reality there was little else they could have done since the Allied navies weren't exactly going to let them out again. Although this meant the Royal Navy had a number of extra battleships all of a sudden, because it was completely unplanned, there were no crews ready for them. As a result, the Agincourt was crewed by whoever they could find, a mixture of the crew of the Royal Yacht, trainees, reservists, and sailors convicted of minor crimes who were ashore in military prison at the time. Due to the more generous quarters, it was nicknamed the Jin Palace, or a Jin Court, by her crew. The Agincourt sailed to join the Grand Fleet as part of the 4th Battle Squadron, alongside Dreadnought, Temeraire, and Bellerophon. In 1915, they were joined by Benbow, Emperor of India, and the Erin, which was the other formerly Ottoman battleship. By the time of the Battle of Jutland, the Agincourt had been reassigned to the 6th Division of the 1st Battle Squadron, alongside Hercules, Revenge, and Marlborough. This was the most diverse unit of Royal Navy battleships, as each one was from a different class. At the Battle of Jutland, the Agincourt was part of the starboard flank of the Grand Fleet. The turn executed put her at the closest point to the High Seas Fleet as they engaged. The ship fired on to the German battlecruisers and a Kaiser-class battleship, but it is not clear if she hit anything. Although the earlier fears about the effect of her broadsides were unfounded, men from other ships said that every time she fired, the sheer number of guns and thus muzzle flashes made it look like the entire ship had exploded. When the Germans launched torpedoes to cover their retreat, the Agincourt evaded two that came near to her, but the Marlborough was hit by one and had to reduce speed to limit flooding. As a result, the 6th Division lost contact with the rest of the Grand Fleet during the night and stumbled across the badly damaged German battlecruiser Seidlitz in the dark. They did not fire on it, however, as they had difficulty working out who the ship belonged to. And of course, Seidlitz had no intention of helping them work out which side it was on. Later in the war, the Agincourt provided cover for convoys to and from Norway, and was present for the surrender of the German fleet at the end of the war. After the war, she was offered for sale back to Brazil, but the South American economy had still not recovered, and so she was kept in the Royal Navy until the Washington Naval Treaty was signed. Then, like all the other Royal Navy 12-inch gun battleships, she was sold for scrap and broken up in 1924. That's it for this extended video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any comments or suggestions feel free to leave them below. If you have a favorite ship, tell us and we'll see if we can get it covered in an upcoming video.